Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Today we're tackling, well, a pretty strange pairing of sources. We've got high fantasy meeting high tech. It's definitely unusual. We're looking at the Dungeons and Dragons specs for Red Dragon Hatchling. Uh, right alongside some dense technical papers from Pathway. And Pathway's describing their new AI architecture, which they've named the Baby Dragon Hatchling, or BDH. Exactly, BDH, it's a post-transformer model. Okay, so the big question is why. This isn't just like a cute name, right? There's a deeper reason. Oh, absolutely. Now, our mission here is to really unpack the technical and you know even the philosophical thinking behind linking this advanced AI to this well, tiny, arrogant dragon. And show you, the listener, how this BDH architecture is designed to fix a major hurdle in AI today, that problem of static, short-term thinking. Right, we're using the DD source material, the SRD entry, and the RTF papers to see how the, um, the specific traits of this mythical creature became a blueprint, almost, for an AI meant to be smart, autonomous, and tough in complex situations. Okay, let's start with the dragon itself. Paint the picture for us. Why the red dragon hatchling specifically? Well, it embodies this tiny tyrant idea pathway seems to be going for. Mm -hmm. Stat-wise, it looks kind of vulnerable on paper. Yeah. How so? It's a small creature, armor class 13, and uh, only nine hit points. Mm. Really low. Okay, nine HP. That's not much. Not much at all. But that's deceptive. Look at its movement. Yeah. Its walking speed is slow, only 15 feet. Yeah. Sort of plodding along. Right. But its flight speed, 60 feet. That's fast. It suggests you know it can operate steadily at a low level, but then burst into really rapid dynamic action when needed. Ah, okay. So slow on the ground, fast in the air, that dynamic contrast. And it's attacks. I remember fire breath. Yep, the classic fire breath. A 10-foot cone. Yeah. But here's the thing, it only recharges randomly, like every four to six rounds. It's not constant overwhelming power. So it's not about brute force. What is it about then? Resilience seems to be the key takeaway. It has this special trait. Magic resistance. Magic resistance, what does that do? It gives it an advantage on saving throws against spells, basically against complex external disruptions. Okay, so translating that to AI, it suggests the model has some built-in way to handle unexpected interference, to kind of shrug off things that might derail other systems. Exactly, born tough, right. you could say. <laughs> able to resist things that mess with its core functioning. And what about its personality? The source material mentions behavior. Oh yeah, this is where it gets really interesting for the AI comparison. The hatchlings are described as keenly intelligent, but also um, famously overconfident for their tiny size. Overconfident, so designed to take risks, punch above its weight. Precisely, and obsessed with value. They apparently have an innate sense for gold and jewels hoarding them away. Okay, so an AI that understands and prioritizes value maybe protects its core objectives. Right, and here's the clincher for autonomy. They might accept powerful surrogate parents, but they tend to treat other members of their adopted brood as, well, as servants. As servants, okay, that's not a helpful assistant AI profile. That's an AI designed to be in charge. That's the feeling, yeah. It's meant to autonomously manage an entire system treating other processes like its underlings to achieve its main goal. Not just helping you, but running the show. So that sets the stage. Dynamic, resilient, maybe a bit arrogant, autonomous. Why couldn't we get this with existing AI, like the big transformer models? What was the gap? Well, the fundamental issue with transformers, and they're amazing, don't get me wrong, is how they learn. They're trained on massive historical data sets. Okay, so they learn from the past. Exactly. They become masters at spotting patterns, decoding correlations, predicting what should happen based on everything that has happened. But what if something happens that's not in the history books? Like you mentioned, a totally unforeseen global event. That's where they stumble. Mm -hmm. Because their understanding, their attention mechanisms are locked in from that initial training. They're fundamentally static. Static. So if you have, say, a financial model trained on years of stability. And suddenly there's a massive unexpected shock to the system, like that embargo example. The model's knowledge is outdated. It's shackled to the past reality. And fixing it means. A huge, slow, expensive retraining process to basically teach it the new rules of the world. Not ideal for real-time decisions. Okay, so BDH is the proposed solution, a post-transformer architecture. Pathway says it mirrors dynamic reasoning of the human brain. What does that actually mean in practice? 
It means continuous learning and reasoning, basically, over long periods, yes. days, weeks, maybe longer. Without retraining. Without retraining from scratch, yeah. It's architecture, they call it scale-free, lets it process data streams constantly, updating its internal state as it goes. It sustains reasoning. Okay, back to the finance example. The old bot sees the embargo news and freaks out or makes bad calls. Right, because the event doesn't fit its historical patterns. Yeah. But a BDH bot, it takes in that new data stream news, market shifts, policy changes as it happens. And it can. Just figure it out. It can evaluate the impact of the embargo, reassess the risks involved, and adjust its strategy, like rebalancing a portfolio, all autonomously. Not because it saw an embargo in training, but because its internal dynamics are built for reasoning about new situations. That's a huge difference. Dynamic versus static. Got it. Okay, now let's get into the weeds a bit. How does this actually work mathematically? You mentioned a scale-free network. What is that compared to a transformer? Yeah, so think about how a transformer works. It often involves global attention, where basically every piece of input data can directly influence every other piece. It's like a big, dense, fully connected, well, brain, maybe. Sounds computationally heavy. It is, very heavy. Yeah. A scale-free network inspired by biology, like you know, actual brains or even social networks, is different. Most neurons or nodes only connect to a few neighbors. Okay. But some nodes are highly connected hubs, linking different parts of the network. It's much more um, sparse and efficient. Think more like the internet map than a solid block. So the intelligence isn't centralized, it kind of emerges from these local interactions. Exactly. The big picture attention or reasoning emerges from these local graph dynamics. Information flows efficiently because only the relevant neuron particles need to activate and adapt based on nearby changes. The paper mentions equations of reasoning for these local rules. Sounds very fundamental. How do these tiny local adjustments lead to the big overall decision, the dragon deciding to breathe fire, metaphorically speaking? Right, so the model's overall behavior, the global property, mm. is essentially derived from these local synaptic updates. When new data comes in, it causes sporadic changes to the connections, the edge weights between nearby neuron particles. Okay. It's a continuous distributed adaptation. Like your neighborhood watch analogy, Local houses reacting to local disturbances determines the overall security feeling of the neighborhood. The global state emerges from local rules. That makes sense conceptually, very different. Now, how do they make this run efficiently on actual hardware, like GPUs, the BDH, Jesh GPU details? They've optimized it. For GPUs, it uses two main components, a RELU low-rank feed-forward network combined with a linear attention mechanism. Why linear attention? Scalability. Traditional attention in transformers is often quadratic it gets computationally very expensive as the input sequence gets longer. Linear attention scales much better, which is crucial for processing continuous, potentially endless data streams in real time. Okay. And the paper mentions a high neuron dimension, but sparse activations. Yeah, that's about handling complexity efficiently. You have a huge potential space for representation. That's the high dimension in chest. But at any given moment, only a small fraction of the neurons are actually active. Ah. So it's sparse, most are quiet. Right. It keeps the computation manageable while allowing for very complex patterns to be represented. This sparsity helps achieve that modular, scale-free structure they see empirically, which mirrors efficiency in biological brains. And all this leads to something they call computational irreducibility. That sounds profound, like you can't second guess it easily. That's basically it, the no easy simulation rule. It means the system's internal dynamics are expected to be so complex that there's no shortcut to figuring out what it will do next. <laughs> Meaning, you can't build a simpler model or run a quick calculation to predict its output faster than just, well, running the BDH model itself. So if it's controlling that power grid during a blackout, you can't just run a quick simulation to see its plan. You have to trust the dragon to fly, so to speak. Pretty much. If its reasoning could be easily simulated or predicted by a simpler system, the learning process would likely converge on that simpler dynamic itself, and it would lose its ability to handle true, complex, novel situations dynamically. That irreducibility is actually part of its strengths for complex tasks. Which brings us to who's using this. This kind of long-term irreducible reasoning must be attractive for serious applications. Definitely. That ability to maintain coherent reasoning over days or weeks, adapting continuously, is a big deal for high-stakes operations. Who are the early adopters mentioned? Well, they highlight some significant names. NATO is exploring it, likely for strategic decision support where things change rapidly. Okay, defense. Makes sense. La Poste, 
the French Postal Service. For massive logistics optimization, think constantly shifting routes, volumes, disruptions. Wow, okay. Huge scale there. And maybe surprisingly, Formula One racing teams. F1? Why? Real-time telemetry analysis during a race, making split-second strategy adjustments based on live data from the car, the track, competitors. It's a perfect use case for dynamic reasoning. Military, logistics, high-speed racing, these are all areas where trust is paramount. If the system is making irreducible decisions, how do you audit it? How do regulators get comfortable? That's actually one of their key selling points and a major advantage over some other deep learning models that could be total black boxes. How so? Because BDH is built on these local graph dynamics, its internal reasoning process is apparently visible and interpretable. You can trace the data flow, see which neuron particles activated, which synaptic weights changed, and how that led to the final output. Ah, so you can see the how, not just the what. That's huge for trust. Exactly. It allows auditors or developers to understand the decision path, debug errors, and verify its reasoning, which is critical for safety-critical fields like autonomous driving or managing energy grids. Makes sense. And Pathway provides the tools to actually deploy this. It's not just the model. Right, they provide the ecosystem a framework for handling the live data streams at high speed and low latency. This includes tools for um, mission critical ETL, extract, transform load, and R, retrieval augmented generation. Built with what? It uses a Python API, so it's accessible, but it runs on a high performance Rust core using something called differential data flow for speed. Essentially, they're providing the whole habitat for the Dragon to operate effectively. So wrapping this up, we've gone from a static transformer model, great at history, to this dynamic, biologically inspired baby dragon hatchling. It seems the key innovation is connecting that global action, the overall decision, to very specific local interaction rules. Yeah, they've managed to bridge that gap by defining these equations of reasoning at the local level, drawing heavily from complex system science. It's a really different approach. And this leads to Pathway's really big, kind of provocative hypothesis about intelligence itself. Right. They suggest that maybe the complex features we see in biological brains like modularity, the way connections change, plasticity, that scale-free structure, Maybe these didn't arise just from eons of learning or training data. But from what then? But from the fundamental requirement of doing reasoning effectively in real time, the very active dynamic reasoning might inherently produce these structures. Whoa. So if that's true, what does it mean for building future AI? Well, it could mean that the path to truly autonomous general intelligence isn't just about throwing more and more data at bigger and bigger models. But instead. But maybe it's more about discovering the right fundamental equations of reasoning, the core rules that govern how intelligence works, maybe even how the universe processes information. The structure enables the function, perhaps more fundamentally than the data. That is a fascinating thought to leave our listeners with. If the secret is finding the universe's built-in rules for thinking, do we sidestep the need for endless data? Could we eventually build an AI that, like that Red Dragon hatchling, is just born smart and ready to go? That seems to be the implication, doesn't yeah. it? Profound shift in perspective.